our next presentation. Our next presented, presenter is Rafael J. Carado. He is a Bible instructor from Theology Department of Central Philippine Adventist College. The college is situated in Negros Occidental Philippines. Now, we will hear presentation. The title is The Swan Geese Ducks. Are they clean or unclean? Welcome, Rafael Carado. Good afternoon to the students and faculty of IS. I would like to say I miss this place so much. This will be my second time to stand here on this pulpit. The first time when I was, when I defended my thesis. And this will be the second time. Since I have only 25 minutes, I will be reading my topic and I hope that all of you will be awake and bring this message to your respective places. But this afternoon, I want to tell you that uh, I'm not here to, to probably teach you, but I'm here to to be, you know, to, to be exposed and to experience the way people present their papers at the forum. The title is The Swan, Geese, and Ducks, Clean or Unclean. Leviticus 11 details the laws that divide all the animals into two groups, such as the clean and unclean animals. The clean animals are regarded as suitable or fit for God's people to eat, while the unclean animals are unsuitable or unfit for food. The account of clean and unclean living creatures in Leviticus 11 is divided into three categories as follows. The land creatures, water creatures, and the air creatures. Under the last category, unclean birds were enumerated, but no distinguishing features are given as it does in the case of beasts and fishes. Thus, the identification between clean and unclean birds today is quite difficult, particularly those birds that are not definitely mentioned in the Bible. Among the unclean birds mentioned in Leviticus 11 as rendered in King James Version is swan, which is or which consequently forbidden as an article of diet. The King James Version render, rendition as swan caused some members of the Seventh-day Adventists particularly here in the Philippines, to ask questions whether this bird is clean or unclean. The bird swan belongs to a family anatidae, which also includes geese and ducks. Thus, the issue to be discussed in this paper is not only limited to swan, but it includes the questions whether geese and ducks are suitable for food or not. However, due to a very limited time and resources, this paper will only use exegetical approaches that will directly deal the issue. You know, being a teacher as well as uh, a dormitory dean in uh, the field is not easy to have time in writing and uh, particularly having resources in the field. First, I would like to trace uh, in the early Adventist perspective some of the reason why, you know, it seems that the bird was permitted to be eaten in our church. The issue whether swan, geese, and ducks are clean or unclean is not new. It was asked by the early Adventists and was answered in some prominent Isdai magazines by some renowned Isdai theologians. In 1934, Leroy E. Fromm commented that the identity of the bird Swan rendered in Leviticus 11.18 cannot be fixed with certainty save that it was obviously not the swan of today. 
He further argued that the swan is very rare in the Holy Land and the feeding habits of this kind are aquatic and the flesh is not in the mosaic list of the unclean and forbidden. In his short apologetic article, Froome did not dogmatically conclude that swan is clean and fit for food, but rather concluded that our choices of food today should not be determined by those permissive flesh foods extended to Israel when they lusted after the flesh pots to which they had grown accustomed. In 1958, Newfield observed that the word Tinshimeth rendered as swan occurs only three times in the scripture which describes Tinshimeth as both a bird and a creeping creature. He concluded that since the etymological, contextual, and contextual study of the word Tinshimeth shed a limited light on the literal meaning of the word, he, he concluded that no dogmatic conclusions can be drawn from Leviticus 11.18 with regard to the classification of ducks and geese in the category of clean and unclean animals. That was... In a year, uh, a year later, 1959, W.E. Reed investigated the issue more comprehensively from the standpoint of the Jewish literatures. Quoting the Jewish Encyclopedia and the Talmud, he cited the characteristics of the clean birds. According to these sources, which I personally checked, the following characteristics of the birds that are clean are, number one, birds with a crop and a gizzard which can easily be peeled away. I have a picture of this, uh, this, this one refers to a crop that could be peeled easily. Uh, another term for crop is gizzard. All right. Then second, birds that catch food thrown into the air but will lay it upon the ground and tear it with their bills before eating are also clean birds. Birds that have an extra toe or talon is also clean bird. A clean bird. This is this one is the this is the the one that that they are referring to as a, a extra two or talon. Okay. Number three, birds that have uh, number f mm, on the contrary, the unclean birds are identified with the following characteristics. Birds that seizes its prey with its claws and eat on the air, and birds with have, which have both sides of the egg are pointed. Now, probably uh, Reed, uh, Dr. Reed really looked into the uh, characteristic of swan ducks, or say ducks and geese, uh, looking at the egg of duck and goose in his paper he finally concluded based on those you know characteristics from the Jewish or Talmud the clean birds included the uh, where where okay I mean read quoted F. L. Mars saying the clean birds included the pasherine birds song and insectivorous birds of today, game and poultry groups, the duck family containing the river ducks and sea ducks, the fish eating mer mergansers would doubtless be omitted. Geese, swans, and weathers excepting only the herons and storks. In fact, the eating of all birds was permitted except birds of prey, carrion, and fish feeders. Thus, the Mosaic law but sanctioned those birds which the the instinct of civilized man has in all ages approved. In the light of this extra-biblical consideration, read dogmatically thought that swan, geese, and ducks pass the above Jewish criteria and believe that these birds are clean. Read assertively said, fowls, chickens, ducks, geese, guinea, fowls, doves, pigeons, and the like are the clean according to the Levitical law. From 1959, the questions about swan in Leviticus 11.18 was seemed settled as clean bird. However, the issue remains perturbing in the minds of some members and was again asked in the year 1984 in this Time magazine. Frank B. Holbrook again stressed that Orthodox Jews regard the duck and goose as lawful and emphasized that only unclean fowls are listed in Leviticus 11. Those not identified thus are presumed to be 
edible. And since ducks, swan, I mean ducks are not in Leviticus 11, uh, he presumed also that ducks is clean. Adventist members started to raise swan. Now since 1884, 1984, many Seventh-day Adventist members started to raise swan, geese and ducks, particularly here in the Philippines, and presumed the flesh of these birds as clean and edible meat. Despite of the, of the previous studies mentioned above, there are many Adventist members who are still in doubt and not satisfied with the arguments presented by the early Adventist scholars. And probably one of the reasons is that the basis of the early Adventist interpretation as I analyze in the concluding, as, an, as I analyze, um, is in concluding that swan, geese, and ducks are clean cannot be grounded biblically with certainty. Rather, they presume the suitability of swan, geese, and ducks for food using the Jewish way and the practices in identifying clean and unclean birds. Whatever are the reasons of doubt, the need of further clarification on the issue is needed. Uh, so, since I was also one of the people who are, was not satisfied of the previous study, I studied it myself. The meaning of Tinshemeth. The word swan in Leviticus 11.18 is translated from the Hebrew word tinshemeth. Morphologists or lexicographers cannot give the exact meaning of this word, but rather offer various derivatives of this word. First, tinshemeth could have derived from the Hebrew verb nasham, meaning to path of the deep and strong breathing, which can apply to the sound of breathing or hissing, snorting made by a bird so that it may mean some kind of owl. Night owl long eared owl, white owl, screech owl. So from Nasham. Second, Tinshimith may have derived from Akkadian word Taslamtu, a type of lizard. The third, Tinshimith may have derived from the Hebrew root Tanash, to breathe, which is related to the Aramaic word Paha, meaning snorter, which may refer to a camelon. Interestingly, Tinshimith is identified both a flying creature and a creeping creature which totally confused the meaning. Moreover, if Tinshimeth is derived from the word Nasham, this is my own analysis, which will refer to a kind of bird like owl or camelon that could produce a hissing or snorting sound, then other birds that are hissing or snorting may qualify also, including swan and ducks. Uh, one of the sources that I have checked uh, tells, uh, tells me that swan was, is also producing a hissing sound. Wow. The above observations, including the various derivatives of the word tinshimith, show a difficulty and uncertainty of this meaning. The same scholars who suggested various etymological derivatives declared that this identification is not certain. Thus, etymologically, and the identification of the exact meaning of the word tinshimeth remains ambiguous, which makes it difficult for many experts to identify. If there are more experts at IAS, please help me. Furthermore, the word tinshimeth is tres legumenon, not enough to give any clear indication of the meaning of the words. Comparing the three passages, Leviticus 11, 18, 30, Deuteronomy 14, 16, to understand the meaning of the word in its context, one will notice the discrepancy in the descriptions of the word tinshimeth. In Leviticus 11, 18 and Deuteronomy 14, 16, the word transcribed as tinshimeth, which is mentioned in the context of unclean air creatures, while in Leviticus 11, 30, the word tinshimeth, which is used in the context of, is used, in the context of the creeping creatures. If Tinshimeth is an air creature in Leviticus 11.18 and Deuteronomy 14.16, and Tinshimeth in Leviticus 11.30 is mentioned among the land creatures, which is rendered in King James Version as mole, then it is a clear indication that the word Tinshimeth is obscure, evident, and uncertain among the Bible translators. Notice the illustration below, Tinshimeth. Okay, air creature, land creature. All right. In addition, the uncertainty of the meaning of the word tinshameth is well supported in many of the commentaries, dictionaries, and lexicons. Scholars identify the meaning of tinshameth variously, such as possibly the glossy ibis or water hen, water hen, some kind of night bird, 
burn uh, burn scratch all the ibis water hen for for young or species of all and unclean aquatic bird and six ceremonially unclean animal hence not eatable winged creature like a kind of owl or a water bird this various identification clearly affirm the uncertainty of the word tinshimeth tinshimeth in other words the word study could not really solve the issue since no one could exactly or certainly give the meaning of tinshimeth the uncertainty in translation the hebrew text of leviticus 11 18 says uh, okay of course wa'et hatin shimeth wa'et haka'ath wa'et haraham uh, the LXX translated this as Kai for Foriona, Kai Filikana, Kai Kuknon. And then the Vulgate, it signum et inokrotalum et forfirionem. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly. And translated by the King James Version and the Swan and the Pelican and the Gear Eager. This is my observation. Looking at the LXX translation, one will notice that the first word which is Porforiona is a translation of a corresponding first Hebrew word, Tinshimeth. However, considering the sequence of the Hebrew text, the last word of the LXX, which is Kuknon, seems to be the translation of Tenshimeth in LXX rather than for Foryuna. Besides, the word Kuknon in Greek means swan. Uh, besides, the word Kuknon in Greek means swan. This means that the arrangement of the Hebrew text is reversed in the LXX sequence. The sequence in Hebrew is seems rightly reflected in Vulgate with signum as the first word and for for unem as the last. If this observation is correct, then both the LXX and the Vulgate identify the translation of Tenshimeth as swan, which is then adopted by the King James Version. The question why the LXX Vulgate and King James Version translated Tenshimeth as swan is not stated. However, this will lead the reader to, uh, to conclude that King James Version is the reliable translation, a good proof for swan as unclean bird. One of the theories given for the King James Version, why the King James Version adopted the swan as the translation, is the probability of preserving swan during the time of King James of England. That is only a theory. Another theory is that the bird swan is wrongly placed among the abominations in the old versions of the Bible. On the other hand, if the LXX translation Porforiona is a correct translation of Tenshimeth, permitting that the LXX order of words is correct, then it is interesting to note that the King James ver Version translation did not follow the LXX translation, which is Porforiona, which is purple or scarlet bird, but rather follow the Vulgate, which is Cygnus, which later on they translated as one. This unusual phenomenon will lead an interpreter to conclude that the King James translation is not re reliable. This problem of translation between the LXX and the Latin Vulgate seems to validate the uncertainty, uh, uncertainty on the meaning of the word Tenshimeth. So, with all the arguments that I have presented, until now, it is still uncertain. The English and Filipino translation Tenshimeth, okay, and the Hebrew, um, we could see there this one translated KGV, the RA, the uh, RWB, YLT, IBIS, NGB, and the rest of the English versions. My analysis, uh, how I wish before that, uh, how I wish I, I could include all the translations in Asia to know whether the word swan is reflected in their language translation of Leviticus 11, 18 or not. I tried one in Indonesian language and found out that the translation of Tinshimeth is burung hantu putih, not angsa or swan. As noted above, and this is now my analysis, the Hebrew word Tinshimeth is translated variously in English and even in Filipino versions. In KGV, the RA, the RWB, and YLT translation, the word Tinshimeth is translated into swan, while other English versions suggest different kinds of birds such as ibis, horn owl, water, water hen, white owl, barn owl, red shank, and red bell. The KGV swan is translated from the Greek kuknon, while most of the English translation seems to reflect the Greek word porphoriuna. Most of this English translation did not also explain why they had adopted such translation of the Hebrew word tenshimeth, which most of them seem to be giving only the probabilities. 
Furthermore, in the Filipino versions, only the Cebuano version adapted, adapted the KGV translation from Swan to Etik. Notice uh, Filipino. While the Tagalog and Ilonggo followed the other English version, in fact, the Cebuano translation of Swan as Etik is wrong since Swan in Cebuano is Gansa, not Etik. The Cebuano version became the only proof text version that swans, geese, and ducks are unclean. However, the Ilonggo and Tagalog, this is unclean, this is not unclean. It, uh, again, again, the Cebuano probably, the Cebuano version became the only proof text version that swan, geese, and ducks are unclean. Yeah, it's correct. However, the Ilunggo and Tagalog versions are in contradictions which become the basis of arguments that swans, geese, and ducks do not belong to the list of abominable birds. These various translations in Filipino of the Hebrew word Tenshimeth show that the correct meaning of this word remains uncertain. One account put it this way, a cursory comparison of almost any mention of specific birds in English translations of the scriptures, especially of the Old Testament, will convince the reader that identifying individual species with Hebrew names is not an exact science. That is why, uh, until this time, it's still uncertain. How about ducks and geese? So, since I could not really, you know prove the exact meaning of Tinshimeth, I give up. <laughs> and uh, went to the question of ducks and geese. How about ducks and geese? The word Barburim in 1 Kings 4.23, if you have read this text before, is cited to mean goose and being categorized as domesticated bird. Most English versions rendered barburim to as fatted fowl, a term that may also refer to ducks, swans, guineas, or guineas, pigeons, or other domestic edible birds, according to Walter Elwell. If barburim is correctly identified as domesticated ducks and geese, and were part of Solomon's table, then these birds may be edible. However, 1 Kings 4.23 did not specifically mention the ducks and geese, and the context is not about clean or unclean birds. Thus, it is safe not to use this passage to prove the edibility of ducks and geese. Uh, of course, if you can prove that Barburim is really ducks, and a swan, ducks, and geese, then it's a good study to prove later on. But for now, uh, I did not go into it because of a uh, limited time. Based on the Jewish way of identifying clean and unclean birds, the domesticated, domesticated ducks and geese, particularly here in the Philippines, seems to have met the qualifications. It is asserted that domesticated birds, particularly the birds not mentioned in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, like ducks and geese, are edible. However, in the case of wild geese and ducks, the certainty whether they are clean or unclean remains in controversies among the Jewish. Although the Jewish tradition seems to classify ducks and geese as clean, the issue remains uncertain since it has no concrete biblical basis. Now, some interpreters quoted also the writings of Elin G. White as the proof text in eating ducks. In my study, I found one page about Elin G. White and her family eating ducks. She said, our provision have been very low for some days. Many of our supplies have gone. We expected supplies three days ago, certainly, but none has come. Willie went to the lake for water. We heard this gun and found he had shoot or shot two ducks. This is really a blessing, for we need something to live upon. A few weeks after the duck eating experience in the Rockies, in October 1873, Elder and Mrs. White were in California, and, sh and she, on February 15, 1873, reported that since they had been in that state, they had dropped meat entirely, having bought meat once for May, Walling, while she was sick, but not penny have we expended for meat since. So after eating ducks, she did not eat meat anymore. 
The context of this account happened in 1873 after she received the vision about health reform in 1863 and 1865. However, even after her vision, she was never a professed vegetarian until 1894, nearly 30 years after her visions. Considering the context of the account, one should understand that Ellen G. White was writing her diary without thinking of Leviticus 11 or having visions about ducks. Thus, the reader should not make the statement about as the basis of eating ducks, geese, and swan today. I will go now to my theological implication. The question is, so what? If uncertain. The theology and rationality of the laws in Leviticus 11 is aptly summarized by Muscala saying, the primary rationality of the Mosaic dietary laws is respect for the Creator. Under this umbrella, other important aspects are included, hollowness, natural repulsiveness, a wall against paganism, health, and respect for life. The respect of the Creator is not about eating for self-gratification and survival, but rather for the glorification of God. Glorifying God is prevalent even in, the, in Pauline's theology as summarized in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, which says, Whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. However, the prevailing question is how can a person respect or glorify God if he is not sure whether what he eats is lawful or not? Since the compelling evidences above show the uncertainty of swans, geese, and ducks, then eating this bird seems to suggest the certainty whether the eaters glorify God or not. The same arguments must be considered in some theological aspects of Levit Leviticus 11, such as holiness, natural repulsiveness, a wall against paganism, health, and respect for life. Accordingly, it is my own contention to agree with William James who writes, in the midst of uncertainty, one is entitled to believe the best. And the best is not to eat. <laughs> Furthermore, the issue whether swans, geese, and ducks are fit for food is obviously an axiological, particularly an ethical issue. In ethical issues, it is an Adventist position to make the Bible as the primary test of what is of good value. Last night, I was happy to, to hear about, you know, pure flour. As a prominent of sola scriptura, Adventists were determined that every step taken with regard to faith and practice would be only that which could be substantiated from scripture. In view of the fact that the word tinshimeth is hapax, and its meaning is uncertain based on sola scriptura principle, assertive ethical conclusion must be avoided. Thus, theologians, pastors, or church leaders should not dogmatically teach the members of the church that swans, ducks, and geese are neither clean nor unclean since the issue lack biblical support. Summary and conclusion. After a thorough investigation of Le Leviticus 11, 18, particularly on the word Tinshimeth, the following findings are being attained. Some of the early Adventist scholars assertively conclude that swan, geese, and ducks are clean and fit for food uh, is not biblical but rather based on the Jewish way of identifying the clean or unclean birds. The contextual, linguistic, and morphological study affirmed the uncertainty of the meaning and identity of the bird Tinshimeth. Number three, the KGV rendition of Tinshimeth as swan, which is the basis of Cebuano translation as etic, varies in many of the English translations and other Filipino versions. The statement concerning ducks from the diary of Ellen G. White should not be the basis in solving this, this issue. Five, theologically, the main issue in Leviticus 11 is a respect for the Creator and eating uncertain things denotes the uncertainty whether a person is glorifying God or not. To conclude, since the meaning of the word Tinshimeth is uncertain even until now, no dogmatic conclusions can be drawn from Leviticus 11.18 with regard to the classification of swan, ducks, and geese in the category of clean and unclean animals. This paper will neither recommend to any Adventist members to raise swans, ducks, and geese for consumption, nor condemn members who are raising and eating these birds. However, I will suggest that we should gradually shun flesh and allow the Holy Spirit to give us power to eat healthy foods for God's glory. Among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating will, will, be, will eventually be done away flesh will cease to form a part of their diet. This is all my study about swan, geese, and ducks.
thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I am still confused whether it is clear or not. So I think we all, some still have so many questions. And then so you can ask. Now it is time to ask our presenter. And, then, and also you can have some comments or some addition or some clarifications. Now it is time. You can raise your hand. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Since uh, this study, the result is uncertain, um, what, uh, and there are a lot of students here, if they want to pursue in studying this, what are your recommendations that you can, the recommendations that you can give them, or uh, like advice, or yes, recommendations for further studies? Okay. Unlike in my study, what I did is, I traced why the issue in the Philippines became an issue. And that is because of the only one Cebuano translation of the King James Version, Etik. Okay? Uh, if the Cebuano translation followed Ilongo and Tagalog, this could not be the issue in the Philippines. So my, my point here is, uh, since the, the, the word is uncertain, why we teach dogmatically the people? I think this is my only concern. Because usually we write papers and sometimes we could not, we could not prove but allows our own presupposition. Because we have many, you know, uh, ducks in our homes. Yes, Pastor. Sometimes languages or local languages or the ancient languages, they really help us a lot and the culture as well. Like we Adventists, we go back to the Jewish culture and their writings to know the actual, uh, you know, uh, meaning of the Bible and the uh, context, uh, context. But uh, uh, in the start, you said basically uh, the classification, there are three classifications. But four, four. Yes. Four actually, okay. Now, now you said four, but if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned three. But yeah. I, what I re re read from the Bible, there are four. Flying mm. in the air, yeah, yeah. then on the ground, animals, and the creeping, and then in the sea. Yes. So the word, the term, tinshimet, that uh, Greek or Hebrew word, if it is still confusing, whether it is used for the air, uh, creature in the air or on the land, that must be mistake. Uh, that mistake is because... You mentioned there are three categories, but there are four. Yes. Okay. And uh, about my country, the language which we use, that is, it has many languages, right? Urdu, we call it, which means legion. It has many ancient languages. It starts from left to right. And for the ducks, and uh, in English, we find word duck for every, the, the river duck or the other duck, they all are duck. No, but in our language, we have different names. The duck and the geese and the swan, and even the ducks, which uh, are river ducks, and even in the river ducks, we have different names among them. So we, it's quite easy for us to differentiate because, like, uh, which we can eat, and all the religions we have, like five or six religions in our country, and the ones who eat, uh, it's very easy for us to differentiate, like from the. Uh, river ducks, like uh, if some of the professor and other from India, if they know about Urdu, murgh abi, we call chicken as murgh, right? And the murgh abi means the chicken of the water. That means no difference whether it is uh, from the river or from the land. This comes under the category of chicken, which we can eat. But the other even in the Bible, in our translation, our translation Urdu is also from the King James Version. But it has different names, particular names about all those birds with the big beak or the heron and everything they have names. 
I don't say we have that uh, we are fortunate to have those translations and uh, we all follow the Bible. No, it's not like that. People have their own choices and they make, they eat, uh, you know, what they want to eat, whether clean or unclean. Okay, that was about the classification and our translation and that helps us. And the classification, I was not agreed if w yeah. when you said three, there are four. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and the last thing which I want to say about us, about Advent is, we know that uh, pork and these things are unclean. We read it from the Bible, it's quite open in all languages, all translations. That is kind of spoon feeding. We, we should not be proud about that. God has blessed us. We have so, you know, so many hospitals, research centers, and we know that. Uh, we need to study about it. The things which we got from the Bible, it's clear. But about these disputes, why, why not our research centers have some studies and some research on it scientifically? They need to use science. They need to get the help from science and use common sense as well. Okay, like uh, pork and all, we can see pork, uh, the baboy or the pig, it looks like uh, its feet, it looks like goat, but when you see it, how it uh, raises its babies, the cubs, it's no more like goat, it's like a female dog. So that's a common sense, we can differentiate that the pig can never replace goat, because it is more like dog instead of like goat. So similarly, in, with these fowls, we can use common sense and our research centers, whom God has blessed with those talents, they can work on it. Okay. Thank you. That is if the identification of the bird or the clean and unclean animals, if we will agree that we will use our common sense only and scientific research, then uh, fine, no problem. No problem. Yeah. Uh, but uh, because of the what we call uh, because as what in my presentation I have presented that for us Seventh-day Adventists we make the Bible as the basis ethical basis and to know what is good and what is not good we base it on the scripture and things that we could not probably establish principles that we could not establish in the in the Bible where shall we go we go to science and common sense uh, if it's good then we, but for me, I will not, uh, okay, as uh, probably, uh, that's why I said uh, it's up for the individual to use their common sense. Yes, yes, yes. Pastor. Yes, my question is, uh, I don't know if you are, in your study, you have explored the word Hebrew, the word mean, who is kind or species, that we translate yes, by kind or species, because... We know the Bible will not give the list of everything. There are millions of animals uh, that we have in the world. And uh, if God have taken the time to list all the things, I think yeah. we will not have uh, a, a place to put them. So I think the, the, the understanding of that issue lies not on the, the different name that uh, all those birds carry. It's just the example that God gave. Mm. What is most important is the word kind. And that word kind is also used in, the, in Genesis to help us to understand that when God creates, he creates things with different kinds. So we have species. And it's among those species that we look. Uh, we look. If you categorize that they belong to the same species, then we cannot eat them because they are in the same species. So we, we will not go. And we know scientifically all those people that get dogs and all the things that they are in the same they are in the same species uh, if if you look all the book science book they will say they are the same in the sense they are the same species so we we i think we can focus in the other things the the name of the the the, the things the, the animals themselves it's okay but uh, it's more it's more deep uh, to focus on the, the word kind in the in Hebrew. Many study, I think people focus most in the, the name of the birds and uh, they don't focus too much on the, the word kind itself, who is, for me, who is more important because kind is related to the nature. But the, the word is translated for uh, many times in, also in Greek. 
uh, as, as the nature of this, the thing itself. That means uh, the genes are of this thing. So I think we should explore also that side of, uh, 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 of the understanding mm. and not stay only on the, this the translation. Way. Because we can translate, even in my language, we, uh, we, we can call many animals and uh, they are different. People can eat anything if you translate it in your language, I'm telling you. Yeah, that is why, everything. Pastor, I, 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 I mentioned earlier that the previous study based, you know, the previous scholars based the study on a kind, particularly on identifying the, the practices of the birds, the nature of the birds. That is why the Jewish, if we base our understanding on the Jewish way of classifying birds, then ducks and swan could be, you know, part of the clean birds. Okay, so that is why uh, the earlier Adventists re did not really hesit hesitate to declare in their papers that ducks and swans are clean. But that is why for me this afternoon, I just want to uh, put this into uh, a clear, you know, probably understanding that the, my purpose here is not really to, uh, you know, really uh, declare whether clean or unclean. But my purpose of studying this is to know the reason why, you know, the Adventist uh, people earlier declared that this bird is clean. Okay. More questions? Okay, thank you so much because we have two more presentations, so we'll close. Because this issue is just for a time being, according to the quotation there. So it will no longer be an issue for those who are waiting for the second coming. Okay. Correct. Okay, to save our time, I will not read all this appreciation letter through, so I would like to present this certificate of appreciation to Rafael J. Carado. Please.